Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you guys are awake. Uh, so we're going to continue today with uh, our second lecture in network programming, and the sort of broad topic for today is language design. Um, so just to review where we came from, uh, last time we spent uh, very little time doing any programming languages, but uh, mostly sort of introducing the domain, so a little bit about networking, um, a lot about this software-defined networking architecture that's gained a lot of momentum in industry, and then we looked at a little formalization of uh, a machine-level language called Featherweight OpenFlow. And so today we're going to move up a bit and look at the design of a higher-level language for network programming, um, and we'll see a bunch of examples. Uh, and then uh, this language we're going to study today, I'm going to spend a bit of time sort of going into it, and I, if you have questions, as I'm sure you will, please ask them, because this will be the basis of the next two lectures, um, so understanding exactly how it works will be important. Um, Later today, uh, I've stolen the hands-on session at whatever it is, 3.30 p.m., uh, we'll look at formal reasoning. So using the semantics we'll develop this morning as well as a different semantics based on uh, axiomatic equations, um, we'll see how we can do automated verification of network properties. Um, and then uh, on Monday, we'll, do, uh, we'll build a compiler for this language and uh, talk about some extensions. Okay, so let me, to set the context, let me uh, give a little more history. Um, so this is our friend, the IBM 360 we talked about last time. And it's a little bit hard to um, have, have a sense for this now, but you know, back in the 1960s, it wasn't obvious that we would use high-level languages uh, to write most programs. There were people who really thought that you know, this was a program, and programming languages would be at the level of machines. Um, and so, you know, where we've gotten to, um, I'll pick Haskell because it's one of my favorite examples of a kind of crazy idea. Let's take this lazy lambda calculus, you know, based on graph reduction and somehow get it to run fast on, you know, modern x86 machines. That's a, that's sort of a crazy proposition and, you know, all kinds of um, cleverness and, and good engineering went into building artifacts like, like GHC that actually do perform amazingly well, um, even though you're taking this you know, programs written in this language that provides beautiful mathematical constructs and getting them to run fast on this grubby, you know, x86 one women machine. But, you know, it wasn't obvious this is what we do. Um, and actually, there were some kind of hilarious um, uh, places in the design space that people explored. So one idea that, uh, that people had was, well, maybe we should, like, design machines that are, you know, tailored to high-level languages. Uh, so there's things like the Lisp machine, if any of you ever go to Brown University, they have one in their uh, atrium. I think th this one's from the Computer Museum. Um, and for various reasons, this was not a good idea, I think. Um, there's a nice paper by Dave Patterson and some other people um, that lays out why you know, there really should be a difference between um, the high-level abstractions that programmers work with and the low-level abstractions that architects and, um, and machines implement. Um, so this idea... Uh, I think is, um, I don't want to say it was debunked, but uh, it, it was not what won the day. Question? Oh, um, I think it's something like uh, thoughts on high-level computing architectures. Let me blow it up when I'm, when I'm done. Retrospective. Or retrospective, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Retrospective on high-level computing architectures by Patterson and, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the other author. Okay, so around the same time, um, when there were sort of these intense debates about high-level languages versus low-level languages, uh, along came Peter Landon, and he wrote this paper that's uh, become amazingly influential called The Next 700 Programming Languages, where he basically laid out uh, one of the pieces of the foundation of modern functional languages. Um, so I have a few quotes from his introduction that I think uh, capture sort of the spirit of his paper. Um, so he starts out, and he's British, so the text is sort of very British, um, says, most programming languages are partly a way of expressing things in terms of other things and partly a basic set of given things. Many linguistic idiosyncrasies are concerned with the former rather than the latter, whereas aptitude for a particular class of tasks is essentially determined by the latter rather than the former. Okay, so that's kind of a very obtuse way of saying you know, most languages have primitives, and those primitives do things that are uh, of interest in some particular domain. So if we're doing, you know, scientific computation, we have, like, arithmetic floating point, 
um, you know, the things, that, maybe vectors, maybe arrays. Um, so we have some sort of constructs that can do various kinds of computation sort of, you know, by themselves um, for the data that we're uh, trying to compute on. And then most languages also have a bunch of other operators like conditionals and control flow and maybe continuations, exceptions. Um, and these things really have nothing to do with the domain at hand, um, or often do not have much to do with the domain at hand. Um, but uh, languages end up being idiosyncratic because they make kind of weird different choices uh, in the sort of you know, general operators that the language offers. Um, and, and Landon, I think, is claiming that um, uh, we, we could basically identify sort of a, a common set of these um, ways of expressing things in terms of other things. Um, that would serve as a foundation for all kinds of languages. Okay, so um, I won't claim to have uh, designed languages that are as wonderful as uh, the languages that Landon worked on, but what we've been doing in our work on language design for networks is to try to take sort of the spirit of, uh, of what's expressed in Landon's paper and try to design higher level languages that um, are based on standard programming constructs and um, have the same mathematical foundation as the languages that we use for programming general purpose devices, but interpret them in the domain of software-defined networking. And again, just to tell you another sort of, I don't know, war story, um, it's, it's kind of hilarious to me that the same debates that were going on in the 60s and 70s are being rehashed in the networking domain. Um, so I'm part of a group of people in academia and industry who's working on a language called P4, um, and there's a design committee um, with a few dozen people who have sort of calls a couple of times a month to hash out various elements of the design. And right now, one of the things we're discussing, we're having intense debates about whether or not the language should have some types. Um, and like, right, everyone's like, yes, we should have some types. Like, you want to be able to express, you know, uh, a, a, data, a piece of data that's either this or that. You want to have pattern matching. You want to have conditionals. Like, all of this boils down to having some types. And on the other side, you have, uh, more maybe engineering focused people who are saying, well, some types are hard to implement uh, on packet processing devices. So, you know, maybe we shouldn't have them because they'll be expensive or, um, or difficult. Um, so this is, again, part of the reason that I enjoy working in this domain is, you know, you get to work on these kind of fundamental questions. Um, and uh, they're, I guess, fortunately questions that we don't have to worry so much about in the general case because for the most part, you know, the field of programming languages has, has had amazing success. Like, no one programs in machine code anymore, or very few people do. Um, most programs are written in certainly high-level languages like C, if not very high-level languages like Haskell. Um, and so that's, I think, a great testament to the successes of our field. Um, but it's fun to go and try to um, sort of fight these same battles again. So before I dive into language design, I want to do a quick demo. Um, some people had asked about uh, materials for the course and also problems. And um, I, because I only have four lectures, um, I don't have time to go into, oops, you can't see this. Hmm. Let me just mirror. Okay, so I don't have time to go into a whole lot of detail, um, but as part of our broader work on uh, the Frenetic project, we've developed a VM that is rendering very oddly. I think I'll leave it at its native resolution. So we've built um, a virtual machine that has all of our uh, software prepackaged on it, and we also have uh, an extensive programmer, programmer's manual and a bunch of tutorials. So if you're interested in getting your hands dirty, um, I, I'll put some instructions on the Piazza site uh, probably later today, um, but if you want to dig in, there's uh, some tools that you can play with. So just to give you a sense of how this works, um, let me just do a quick demo. Um, so here is the repeater that we looked at yesterday, a slight variant. Um, so you'll see, okay, good. Is this legible? Is the font big enough in the back? One step up? I couldn't hear that. Yeah, I'm worried that I might not be able to see anything. Um, let me see if I can make it. Mm. Try. That didn't do 
much. Let me try 14. Oh, now I'm 10. OK, we'll try that. OK, so um, there's some standard boilerplate that is just uh, pure OCaml that sort of uh, packages up uh, the implementation of one of these network programs with our standard runtime. Um, so this is all done using modules and functors. Um, but essentially, the frenetic aux module provides a functor make. And you can pass in an application, which has to provide implementations for each of the event handlers um, uh, that's in OpenFlow. And then it will sort of plumb everything together and build a controller for you that accepts connections from switches and sends the events to those functions. Um, so what I'm doing here is uh, when a switch connects, uh, OK, I'm not bothering to delete any old rules. If we run this from scratch, it'll be fine. Um, I'm just sending down uh, an instruction to flood everything at all ports. and then. For the reasons we discussed yesterday, when a packet comes in, I'll also just send it back out, um, sending it out all the ports. OK, and then there's some boilerplate at the bottom, uh, basically to uh, build the controller, which is just applying the functor, and then you have to call uh, start. OK, so I can build this. We have a little helper that wraps <coughs> OCaml build with the right incantations. And this will uh, build and link it. And now if I run the repeater, um, what happens is it basically uh, starts up uh, a, a low-level server, a low-level OpenFlow server that will uh, listen to connections from switches. And then uh, <coughs> it hooks up your, your application code uh, to that OpenFlow server so that the events flow between them. Now if we want to try this out, um, we need to have a network. Um, fortunately, there's some nice uh, network simulators that run using uh, a lightweight form of virtualization that Linux supports. Um, and you can simulate sort of networks with maybe hundreds or thousands of hosts, even on a laptop, even on a VM running on a laptop. Um, so this thing is called Mininet. Um, and Mininet has a bunch of uh, sort of baked in things. Sorry, this is really hard to read. So I can make it bigger. Up to 14. Okay, that's a little better. Can you make it white? Yeah, sorry. I, let's see. Let's make the background white and the font white. That's going to be fun. And the terminal font, background, foreground. Okay, that's better. Better? Great. Uh, so, Mininet uh, will start up a network, including switches and hosts. And the beauty of Mininet is that they're all just Linux processes. So you can use whatever tools you want to generate traffic and send it through the network. Um, and the switches are actually a software switch called OpenV switch that speaks OpenFlow. And it's a real, it's, it's the same software switch that's used by VMware in some of their products. Um, so it's you know, a fully faithful sort of functional implementation of a network. Um, the one thing it doesn't give you, of course, is any kind of performance, fidelity with performance. Um, if you, you know, emulate some big network on your laptop, it may, uh, certain components may run faster or slower than what would happen if you ran them, you know, for real on, on network hardware in a data center. Okay, but anyway, so we're going to start up a very simple network that has a single switch and two hosts. Very boring. Um, it's going to connect to our controller, which is... Um, uh, remote, uh, meaning that it has controllers built in, so if you don't pass this, it will run some default controller that you probably don't want. And just to simplify things, I'm going to um, statically uh, set the ARP protocol so that the mapping between Ethernet addresses and, and IP addresses is baked in. Okay, so what happens when I run this command is that, uh, okay, it couldn't connect it first, and then it connected to the controller, and it adds this network with two hosts and one switch. And then it has links between each of the hosts and the switches, and it does some configuration. So I can see the network, and I see that uh, these things are hooked up um, basically in a line. So now what I can do is uh, I can start to uh, run commands, uh, and I can run them from certain hosts. So if I want to maybe send a ping probe from host 1 to host 2, I can prefix the whole command by h1, and that will cause that command to be run on h1. So if I say h1 ping h2, um, what will happen is h1 will send a ping probe to h2. And if we did our job right, h2 will respond with uh, the reply, and it will get sent back to h1. And indeed, that's what happens. Um, and we can do the other way as well. 
Unsurprisingly, that works. Um, so, so what's going on? Um, so remember, our uh, controller sent down exactly one rule that matched everything and flooded it out all ports. Um, and since we only have two ports, um, all ports except the one it came in on is just the other port. So basically, traffic's getting sent in both directions. Um, we can go over to the controller and uh, see what happens. And the controller sort of logs everything it does. So you see that, OK, after some initial uh, setup, a switch whose identifier was 1 connected to this controller. And then we got a packet in message uh, that was from some MAC addresses. Uh, looks like a discovery uh, frame type. So basically, before the switch had been configured, um, the hosts sometimes are running, they're running Linux, and sometimes they uh, are a bit chatty, and so they'll send out packets. And in this case, the packet got sent to the controller before the controller had installed the rule, and so we saw the packet in message. Um, the, the controller logic would have sent it out, so it got forwarded wherever it was trying to go. Um, but you'll see that no other packet ins arrived. Um, so what we should see is that if we examine the state of the switch, that all of the packets were processed by the switch without going up to the controller. So look, to do that, um, we can run a command called uh, OVS, I'm going to have to run it on the switch, OVS OF control dump flows, and then I have to tell it which switch I'm dumping flows for, and that's uh, S1 again. And what you see is a not very pretty uh, printing of a table. Um, in this case, the table has one entry, and there's some additional metadata, sort of like how long has this rule been there, um, the identifier of the table, and then the number of packets and bytes that it's processed. Um, in this case, because our pattern matched everything, uh, we don't actually see a rendering of the pattern. Uh, Open vSwitch just prints nothing if the pattern matches everything, so that's what would be right here. If we were matching on specific addresses, you'd see written out what, what addresses the rules um, uh, matched, and then the actions are <coughs> uh, all, which is Open vSwitch's name for the flood action. Okay, so this is very, very simple, um, you know, almost trivial, um, but I wanted to show you this to give you a sense of um, how you can uh, run these things and some of the tools you have for uh, playing with things. Um, so, again, I don't have time to sort of spend a lot of time on this, and um, I know some of you will be very familiar with um, sort of networking technologies and using VMs and things like this. If you're interested and would like to dive in, uh, I have, we have a six-hour tutorial that we've done at PLDI and eCoop and other places. We have a many dozen page programmer's manual, and I have a few exercises that, I'll, again, I'll post. Um, so if you want to try them out, it's, it's kind of fun to write these programs, and we have a lot of support uh, for making it uh, easier to do it. Okay. So actually, before we move on, let me um, show you one more thing. I'm not going to run it, but um, So, it's a little bigger. Sorry, my fonts are annoying. Okay. So, yesterday when I showed you the learning switch, uh, remember this was the slightly smarter hub-like thing that still gave you plug-and-play functionality, but it had this nice property that it initially floods and then it falls back to point-to-point -point forwarding once it's learned where hosts are. Um, so, one of the things that I did, which went kind of fast, is when a packet came to the controller, it came to the controller because the switch didn't have a rule for processing that packet. So it's a, it's a thing we haven't learned yet. And we would run both the learning function up here that would stick the source address and the port it came in on in a hash table, and then we would try to route it. And we would try to route it by uh, looking up in the hash table the destination of the packet. And if we had it, then we'd put a pair of rules um, one that matched uh, things going uh, from the source to the destination and one coming from the source and, sorry, and one the other way around. I'll say it backwards if I try to say it twice. So one question for you is, why, why do I bother matching on both? So why don't I just, when I've learned a host, immediately send down a rule that says all packets going to this host whose location I've just learned should go out that port. 
I can think of what might go wrong if I did that. So it's not going to cause loops. That's a good thought. But um, be, this is one of those problems that like, has enough sort of up and down, left and right, source and desk that it, your head kind of explodes. So we're going to install a rule. So when, it, when we get a packet from a, coming from a source, we're going to remember its source, and we're going to install a rule that says any packet whose destination is that address should go back where it came. So this packet presumably doesn't have the host's own destination. It's probably going somewhere else. So it's not going to loop back. But there's something more subtle and devious that's going to happen. I saw another hand. Uh, well, the table would actually, be, I'm not sure what you mean by efficiency, but the, the table would actually be smaller. So if we have a network with n hosts, this code's going to produce tables of size n squared, because we're going to get, or order n squared, because we're going to get one rule for every combination of source and destination. I don't think that's a problem, but um, because w w what we're doing is we're just sending. So, first of all, the, the problem that I'm thinking of occurs with just one switch, so we don't need multiple switches. And so the hosts are directly connected to the ports. And when we learn the association of a port and a MAC address, we know that, again, ignoring the possibility that hosts might move around, that the host is located at that port. So that would definitely be a problem. Um, but there's an even more devious problem. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not going to consider mobility for, for this code. Um, but yeah, we, there are ways to make this code more complicated. Essentially, you have to, well, maybe this will be a hint. So if you want to handle mobility, where hosts might move around, then if you think about it, what you need to do is you, make, you need to make the rules even more specific. So you need to add the port in the pattern that's on the switch. You would basically say, only for packets that come from this source on this port going to this destination go out that, de go out that port. So there's a trade-off. As, as we make the rules more specific, they match fewer packets. As we make the rules more general, they match more packets. And that affects the visibility that the controller has into where hosts are. So very coarse-grained rules that match lots will process most of the packets in the switch itself, and they won't go to the controller. Exactly, exactly. So th this, this bug is really subtle. Um, let me try to articulate it carefully. Um, maybe I'll draw a picture. So let's say we have a switch with four hosts attached to it. And uh, there's a table that we use that controls forwarding on the switch. And it's just going to match on destinations. So I'll draw it just as destination and port, or action. How about? So suppose that host 1 sends uh, a packet to host 2. And the controller's up here. So the controller is going to receive a message saying, I got a packet from host 1 on, assume these ports are numbered the same as the host. So I got a packet from host 1 on port 1. And in the scheme I'm imagining, the controller is going to immediately install a rule that says, if the destination is h1, then forward out port 1. So now host 2 is probably, probably the next packet that arrives in the network is host 2 replying. If it's a ping, then host 2 is going to reply to the ping. If it's a TCP uh, packet, if it's a SYN, then, then host 2 is going to do SYNAC. So whatever, you know, it's highly likely that host 2 will send the next packet back. And what's going to happen is host 2 will send a packet to the switch 
whose destination is host one. And so uh, it's going to hit the table and get forwarded out port one. So that's good. The packet got delivered to where it was supposed to go. But notice that we didn't learn where host two is. So now if host one sends another packet to host two, that's still going to go to the controller. It's still going to be flooded. And we haven't learned anything new. We still, host one is still where it is. So essentially, the, the bug is, if we install rules that are too big, they match too many things, then the controller won't where all the hosts are. And this is bad because this controller is just like a server or a cluster of servers. This connection is really expensive to use. Um, it's, you know, let's say, two to three orders of magnitude slower than just processing in the data plane. So we're now killing performance. You know, anything that goes from host one out goes on this extremely slow path up to the controller and then flooded everywhere. So that's really not what we wanted from a switch. OK, and the root of the problem, as, as I see it, is that what we wanted was to say that the network should do two different things. It should learn the locations of all hosts, and it should forward packets to those hosts, either by flooding or by sending point to point. And so if we left off the more precise match here, the controller, as we did right here, the controller would not learn the locations of all hosts. And that means we'd be stuck in the flooding mode for longer. So if I match, so the, so the way to fix this bug is to only install a rule when you know both the source and the destination. So if you know both the source and the destination, then you can install a rule because you're not going to harm yourself from learning either locations of those hosts because you already know them. Yeah, so you, you install n squared rules instead. And that's exactly what, th what this code is doing. So basically, this is only going to fire, this block of code will only fire when we have the response and then we will have learned the, in this example, the H2 location. And now we have both and we install these, this quadratic set of rules. OK, so that was a little bit low level and fiddly. Um, but it's an instance of a problem that comes up um, way more often. So let me sort of abstract uh, back up uh, to sort of pictures. And you know, one key thing that you want of, I think, any language design is that it should support various forms of composition. You want to be able to express functionality, reason about it, optimize it, and then take those pieces and plug them into bigger programs. Um, and so in our learning switch, we wanted to do forwarding and learning. And in other situations, you can imagine wanting to do things like maybe routing, traffic monitoring, and firewalling. And so you'd like to be able to support some kind of software stack. Um, here I've divided it into two levels, but it doesn't really matter. Some kind of software stack where you can sort of write library modules or whatever, however you want to organize your, your sort of collections of code, and then glue them together to get bigger applications. And the problem is, in most controllers that are out there today, um, with the exception of Frenetic and Netcat and a few others, um, they don't support this kind of modular composition. Um, they're more like aux. You're kind of writing machine code. And so when you write your application, you have to consider all of the functionality. And the functionality of one piece of your application ends up sort of seeping into the other pieces of your application because you have to consider all their interactions. You don't have any kind of high-level constructs that let you uh, sort of divide up functionality and reason about them independently. OK, and this is bad. I probably don't even have to tell you. You know, it makes writing programs harder. It makes it hard to reuse code across applications because the details of each piece of code is tied up in the overall application. It makes it hard to port functionality to new platforms. Um, even in the context of SDN, these low-level machine languages have been evolving very quickly. Um, so it's, in general, just not the way to do good software engineering. Let me show this with another example. Um, here's uh, sort of pictures of the tables that you'd get, you might get from simple implementations of uh, the modules I showed you, routing, monitoring, and firewalling. So I'm assuming here that um, I have some application that's generating tables that are doing routing. Um, here they're matching on destination IP addresses, and then they're forwarding out uh, the next hops towards those addresses. And for the sake of the example, suppose that I also want to do some kind of monitoring. Maybe I want to count 
how much traffic uh, is coming from some particular sources. Perhaps these sources have been deemed to be suspicious or untrustworthy. So I'd like to you know, both route using destination addresses, but also monitor things coming from this particular source. And I'm not going to worry too much about writing exactly precise open flow here. Uh, I'm going to sort of use stylized open flow-like languages. So don't uh, well, ask questions if anything's confusing, but uh, this is not you know, genuine open flow. OK, so the problem is I can't just sort of do some simple combination of these two tables uh, to get what I want. Um, instead, I have to consider sort of all possible interactions between each of the rules in those two tables. In particular, um, you know, I have to, it would be incorrect to just sort of spit out the routing component and then spit out the monitoring component because the semantics of these tables is not that they get sort of matched in parallel. Instead, they get matched from top to bottom. So if I stuck the routing rules first, then I might miss some of the monitoring that I wanted to do. And conversely, if I stick the monitoring rules first, then packets coming from 1, 2, 3, 4 might not get routed. So what I have to do is I have to basically intersect them. And what I do is I consider all possible intersections of their patterns. And I emit those rules first. And then once I've covered the overlap between these two tables, then I can emit the sort of concatenations of the tables below that. And so you get this bigger table you see here. And in the intersection, I do both actions and then the residual tables that we fall through to in the case that we're not in the intersection have the original actions. So this is a little clunky. Um, and you know, it would not be hard to automate this, but the point is most languages that are out there today give you tables as the abstraction that you program with. And so when you write your program, you can't write these two tables independently and then, well, you could, you could write your own sort of merge operator, but in practice, people end up writing these tables by hand. And again, you know, they have to consider the functionality of the entire application in each rule that they write. And just to kind of hammer the point home, let's suppose we want to throw on a firewall. Maybe we want to block SSH traffic. It's actually a terrible policy. I would hate a network that blocked SSH traffic, but whatever. So suppose we want to do that. Here it's even trickier because for a firewall, I don't, well, I know I want to drop things going to destination port 22. But I don't, you know, other traffic I sort of don't care about. So I don't even know how to express this as a table. But again, if I wanted to now sequentially compose my firewall in, I would again get a sort of all pairs interaction between the firewalling rules and the routing plus monitoring rules, and I'd get a bigger table that you see here. Okay, so this is not good. Um, and, you know, the reason is that most current APIs that uh, software-defined network and controller support basically expose the machine language itself, languages like OpenFlow, as the abstractions that programmers work with. And so when you're writing these programs, you have to think about tables and how you express patterns, the priorities that you insert rules into the tables. Um, I didn't show this yesterday, but there's things that rules can time out. You get these asynchronous events. So the programmer has to kind of deal with all of this. And uh, this makes programming complicated, tedious, and um, and sort of anti-modular. Okay, so the, a much better approach, and the one that we've developed in our work on Fernetic and NetCat, is to just get away from programming the hardware directly. And instead of APIs that are based on high-level linguistic abstractions, um, and the one that I'm fond of and that our languages are based on is, is sort of functional programming. So we let the programmer write pure functions on packets, um, and this language has some domain-specific features that are kind of tuned for network programming. So we give them not just tables of positive conjunctions of tests on packet headers, but we actually give them a sort of standard you know, language of, of logical predicates. Um, and instead of giving them um, uh, sort of a limited set of primitive actions, we let them write sort of mathematical functions on packets. And we give them uh, features that span multiple devices instead of just a single, single device. And we give them high-level combinators that take programs and, uh, and merge them together in various ways. And we'll see this uh, on Monday when we get to um, dealing with dynamic changes. We'll also give them features like atomic transactions. Okay, so again, uh, what we're going to focus on today is this higher-level language for writing packet processing functions. Okay, so... Uh, this is a little bit of 
further throat clearing. But you know, our vision is that you write programs in these high-level languages. Um, you have compilers and runtime systems that handle the complicated but mostly mechanical task of turning these descriptions of high-level behavior into um, low-level efficient implementations. And uh, we also, as we'll see this afternoon, get tools for reasoning about properties of networks automatically. Okay, so let me jump right in now, kind of enough throat clearing for the morning, um, and show you uh, the NetCat language sort of by example. Um, so the model, again, is we're going to have uh, functional programs that operate on packets, which, as I showed you yesterday, will just model as basically records of values. Um, one small difference is sort of cute. We're going to sort of pretend that the location of the packet in the network is just another header field that we can match and modify. So the packet has all of its standard headers, and it also has um, a location which can be, for example, a particular switch in a particular port. And so these functions can move packets around in the network by modifying the switch in the port. Um, I said these are going to be pure functions. Um, so you might wonder how you could handle more complicated applications like the learning switch that are stateful. Um, and there's a kind of phase distinction that we've used in Netcat, um, in part for simplicity and, and in part um, uh, because it's fundamental, where um, each Netcat program describes sort of an instantaneous configuration of all the devices in the network. So from the programmer's perspective, they, write, they have to write some other application in, say, OCaml or Python. And that application generates a Netcat program that describes the configuration of the whole network. The compiler then uh, pushes that down into configurations for the tables, and the network you know, implements the function denoted by the Netcat program for the time being. When something happens, like the topology of the network changes, or a host enters or leaves, or maybe the controller gets traffic statistics, then that application, which is, again, just an arbitrary OCaml program or Python program, can keep state, and it can make decisions and generate a new Netcat program. And so uh, essentially the way we handle stateful and dynamic behavior is that you have this sort of uh, two-level structure where a general purpose program generates a sequence of, um, of Netcat programs that get passed to the compiler in runtime. And if you sort of you know, integrate over all of these static snapshots, you get dynamic behavior. Questions? So if these are programs that describe a whole network of behavior, does this mean that a single, if something being plugged into one, one port of one switch triggers a whole network reconfiguration? That can happen, yeah. And sometimes you want that. Um, yeah. Um, let me briefly say that, um, so the reason for this distinction was that um, OpenFlow does not support any state on the switches except for the counters, which are essentially sort of sit there passively collecting a read-only. More recent uh, SDN languages do support state on the switches. And so um, we've recently been exploring a stateful version of Netcat where you can actually write programs that uh, have local data structures and make local <laughs> manipulations of those data structures. Um, and, and then this picture changes. So essentially, you can push some of the logic that's in that blue box into the Netcat program, and the network sort of implements the program automatically. Um, there are very um, things get much more complicated in that setting, uh, in particular how you reason about consistency. So you're, you're basically in the, you basically now have sort of concurrent shared memory programming. And so you have to worry about consistency and, um, and many other issues. Um, but you can see we had a paper in PLDI just last week about the design and semantics of that language. Uh, it's done by uh, Jed McClurg, who's at Colorado, and his advisor, Pavel, and uh, Hossein Hujat, who's a postdoc with me. Question. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, as, as we'll see, I, I don't want to dwell on the slide much longer, but as we'll see, even just describing the behavior of the switches turns out to be quite rich okay. and uh, interesting. So, yep. Yep. Okay. So let's go in and, and look at some examples. Um, so I'm going to use this sort of baby example of a simple barbell topology with just two switches, A and B. And uh, suppose that what I want to do is implement two paths that go from the upper left, so port one over to the upper right, port five, 
and from the lower left to the lower right. And to start, let's sort of see how we might write these if we were uh, programming the individual devices themselves. So on switch A, uh, if we had a sort of uh, simple, you know, standard looking language, um, and we're writing some kind of packet processing function, we could just write the function that modifies the port. Remember, every packet carries its switch and port with it. So we can just modify the port to three. And what's going to happen operationally is, you know, packets that come in uh, on either port one or port two, they'll have port one or two, and we'll set it to three, and that will cause the switch to output the packet on port three. And then the topology is going to carry, that link is going to carry it from port three to port four. And then we can program switch B to do the right thing. Except that we can't. Ah, so I'm only going to consider traffic going left to right. Okay. Um, so when a packet comes out on port three, the link is going to send it over to port four, and I'm not going to program port B to send it back. But this is just for the sake of an, ex an example. Yeah, you, in practice, you'd want to handle the other traffic flows as well. Okay, so we have a problem here, uh, which is if we want to implement these two paths, we've successfully moved the packets over from switch A to switch B, but now I don't know what to do on switch B. I get packets coming in on port four. They're packets that both originated at one and two, but I have no way to distinguish them. So I'm kind of stuck. So what I have to do instead is I have to write a more complicated program at switch A that distinguishes these two cases, coming in on port one versus coming in on port two, and then actually adds some tag to the packet, um, add some extra bits to keep track of where the packet came from. And so I'm just going to use tags one and two corresponding to ports one and two. And then I can forward it over to port three. Um, so what I've done here, I haven't explained all these operators, we'll do it shortly, is I'm using a sort of sequential composition to handle the port one case and port two case. And I'm just um, composing together tests which behave like filters. So a test retains, it sort of packets come in and either they satisfy the test or they don't. If they satisfy, they sort of go through. If they don't, they just get dropped. And then these modifications that actually take any packet coming in and just clobber the corresponding bits to have the value that's specified. So you can read this kind of like a little uh, streaming functional program. And then the plus operator is uh, a union operator that basically says does do, do both of these behaviors. And in this case, because they start with disjoint tests, uh, doing both behaviors, there's no overlap between them. So every packet either, well, some packets could match neither of them, but uh, all packets coming in on ports one or two either match the top clause or the bottom clause. Okay, so now that we have this tag on switch B, we can match on the tag, which tells us where the packet originated and then send it out the right port on port B. Um, and these tags, you could think of them as being, uh, if you know something about networks, they could be like VLANs or tunnel identifiers if you had something like MPLS. Um, so there's, you know, networking folks have come up with all these, you know, IETF standards and so on for how to uh, implement these kinds of tunnels. And in general, it involves adding some kind of tag to packet so that you can distinguish what happens at intermediate points in the tunnel. Okay, so you can do this, um, but it's kind of tedious. It's annoying that even for this example where I made it so simple, two devices only considering traffic going from left to right, I still had to kind of think about the interactions between these two devices to implement these two paths. So Netcat has some features that are designed to support what we call global programming. And this is, I think, one of the most powerful things in the language is that you don't have to think sort of hop by hop. You can actually write programs that describe network-wide behavior. So the way this works in Netcat is I can actually um, program with sort of the links in the network. So I can write a program that uh, is a bit simpler than what we just saw, where I basically match on packets coming in on port A, on, on switch A, port one rather, and then I just move them from A to B, and then spit them out port five. And I can just write that as one big program, and I can union that program with uh, the corresponding uh, uh, program for the bottom path, and the compiler is gonna take care of adding the tags needed to implement uh, this little program here. 
Um, it's going to, so if you try to forward from a switch that you are not on, it will behave like uh, a filter that doesn't match, so it will drop the packet. So if I tried to, if I matched on port one on switch A, and then I tried to forward from switch Z to switch X, that would behave like a, uh, that would also drop, yeah. Or another way you can put it is that um, you can either have it drop, or you can say that all the links that are implied, that are mentioned in your program must be real links in the network, or it doesn't make sense. Okay. Okay, so this is simpler and, and more elegant. Um, and we can go further. Um, so I haven't mentioned this, but one of the big killer apps for software-defined networking has been something called virtualization. And this is just like what happens in, with virtual machines like uh, VMware or, uh, or, or, or Zen or other uh, virtual machine hypervisors. Um, people are interested in taking virtual networks that don't really exist and running them on top of physical networks that might have different structure, but getting sort of faithful emulation of the virtual network. So one thing you can do in Netcat and several other SDN frameworks is you can define virtual topologies and a common one that's sort of popular is I could define sort of a big switch that has ports for all of the outward facing ports in my network, but it abstracts away from the internal topology in the network. So I can build this, this big switch with ports one, two, five, and six. And now I don't even have to write those links. I can just, uh, I can just say, you know, everything coming in on port one goes out port five and everything coming in port two goes out port six. And this is, you know, even simpler. So the Netcat compiler needs to, needs, to know, needs to have descriptions of the physical network and the relationship between the virtual network and the physical network, the, the dotted lines that I've drawn here. But uh, yeah, our compiler can figure out how to synthesize the paths through the physical network to implement these virtual things. And it can, do, it can actually do arbitrary virtual topologies. So your virtual topology could be bigger than what the physical topology has, or it could have, um, yeah, it's just an arbitrary relationship. Okay, and we need to go a step further. You know, I, I said that one of the main motivations for having a language was to, to support composition. So here, you know, suppose I want to maybe compose in a firewall, like something that drops SSH traffic, and I can do that uh, just using sequential composition. So I can write a test that says anything that's not SSH traffic, uh, or rather anything that's not coming from an SSH server, I've flipped things around here, uh, gets to go through and everything else gets dropped. Okay, so that's kind of the, the language by example. Um, let me try to, I think you guys are waiting for sort of some formal meat to dig your teeth into, so let's, let's do that. So just to summarize, the language design is sort of motivated by three main concerns. Um, first, we want to have network-wide abstractions. We want to get away from programming individual devices, but somehow be able to express behavior that spans multiple devices. Um, we want to get away from programming these tables and be able to work with just logical predicates. So we need to be able to sort of express rich forms of classification on packets. And then we want to have modular composition where we can take Netcat programs and glue them together with standard programming constructs like sequential composition. Okay, so uh, if you um, uh, sort of design a language that has those three properties and then distill it down to a core calculus, sort of like lambda calculus, uh, this is perhaps what you come up with. And this is the syntax of Netcat. So I'll step you through it piece by piece. Um, and I should say in advance, uh, so Netcat is based on something called cleaning algebra with tests. And uh, that has a sort of algebraic syntax. And then there's kind of a programmatic syntax that's used in implementation. And I've tried to make my slides consistent, but um, in different modes, I'll use different symbols. Um, in particular, like the dot operator you see there is the same as the semicolon operator. Um, but I'll jump back and forth between them sometimes. And I apologize for the confusion. Okay, so what is Netcat? So essentially, it's the language you get if you combine a sort of standard language of Boolean predicates. Um, so I have uh, false and true. I have that are predicates on packets. They just uh, check if a particular field is equal to some value. And then I have uh, disjunction, which I write with plus, conjunction, which I write with the dot, and negation. Um, and one important note, although um, I've written the grammar here to sort of allow negation to be applied anywhere, um, if I had more space or I made this more complicated, I would actually require that negation can only be applied to predicates. So you can't negate other operators, like you can't negate a link or negate a star. Okay, 
then we also throw in uh, a language of regular expressions. And we actually overload some of the operators uh, using them both for the predicate language and the regular expression language. Um, so here, false is sort of the empty language. True is the analog of epsilon. And then plus is union, dot is concatenation, and star is cleanly star. And the intuition for these regular expressions is uh, these regular expressions give us uh, a nice way to construct paths through the network. Um, if you think about the connection between regular expressions and automata, you know, regular expression kind of describes a set of paths through an automaton. An automaton is a kind of graph, so um, that maybe gives you some sense that you know, a regular expression-like language would be a nice formalism for describing paths through a network as well. Um, and then we have a couple of primitives that uh, are specific to packet processing. It turns out we actually only need two. Um, so we need this modification operator, which clobbers some bits in a packet and sets them to some value. And then we also need uh, this link primitive that moves packets around in the network. OK, so um, the reason that the language is called netcat is that um, Dexter Cozen, who's my collaborator on this work and uh, colleague at Cornell, has been working on uh, many, many, many systems that are based on combining Boolean predicates, or he calls them tests, with regular expressions, or as he calls them, Kleene algebra. So K KAT is Kleene algebra with tests, and it's a um, general framework for doing deductive reasoning about, uh, you can reason about imperative programs, uh, probabilistic programs. Uh, there are many, many, many uh, examples. It's just a sort of general algebraic uh, system that's extremely beautiful. And if you haven't seen it before, take a look. It's really wonderful. Um, and netcat is just a particular instance of Kleene algebra with tests where we interpret it in this domain of networking and add a few more primitives uh, to, to handle packet processing. Say it again? Uh, you, you mentioned that those for yeah, so dot, uh, dot and semicolon, just treat them as the same operator. Um, when I'm writing programs, I tend to use semicolon because I don't have a dot on my keyboard. Um, when I'm doing mathier things, I'll use the dot. <laughs> well, so, so dot stands both for concatenation and for conjunction. It turns out that the same definition gives us both behaviors, and we'll see that in just a sec. OK. Um, and in fact, here I've jumped back to semicolons. <laughs> um, so one of the neat things about clean algebra with tests is you can actually encode um, other more familiar constructs uh, in terms of these operators. Um, so if I have uh, conditionals, for example, you know, if B, then P1, else P2, that's just the union of the test B guarding P1 and the negation of B guarding P2. And likewise, if I want to encode a loop, a while loop, that's just uh, a combination of the guard of the loop B, uh, composed with P star, and then not B when I exit the loop. Uh, yeah, so this is a core calculus. You could throw these things in as primitives if you wanted to avoid that, but um, we're not going to do that. We're not going to worry about that kind of blob. OK, so this is the syntactic definition of the language. Now let's look at semantics. Now I think, have, has, I think in, this course, in this summer school, you've not seen denotational semantics yet. Is that correct? You've not. Sorry, I asked the question in a bad way. Have you seen denotational semantics? No, OK. Uh, many of you, I think, have seen this before. Um, if you haven't, uh, denotational semantics is uh, this other style to defining meanings for programs, where instead of giving some operational model, maybe defined by a set of inference rules, um, we instead give a translation function that goes from the terms in our language to some set of mathematical objects. Um, and denotational semantics uh, has, uh, I'm so nervous about what I say because the video is recording. So now, and now when anyone watches this, they're going <laughs> to look carefully at what I say next. Um, let me just be blunt. So, Denotational semantics is, uh, has a bit of a bad, a bad rap in, um, in some, uh, some subsets of our community uh, because when you try to apply it to uh, very complicated models, the mathematical structures that you need get quite complicated. Um, and um, so for, I think, a bit of history, so sort of in the you know, 80s and 90s, uh, 
most PL researchers would, would use both unitational semantics and operational semantics um, you know, whenever, whenever it was best. And there were proponents of both, but they were kind of both actively being worked on. Um, eventually, some people, uh, well, so there were uh, some results like uh, Harper uh, and, and some other people you know, showed that uh, there's sort of a really nice uh, recipe that you can follow using uh, operational semantics. Uh, to prove imp important properties of, of languages like type soundness. Um, and it's sort of very robust. You can sort of apply it to lots and lots of different kinds of languages with you know, very complicated features. And you don't sort of um, run into these walls in the same way as you do with denotational models. Um, and so you know, in, in, in a lot of uh, graduate courses, you know, denotational, denotational semantics is not even taught anymore because people uh, think that operational models are uh, are sort of, you know, in some sense best. Um, I think that that trend is actually not great. Um, uh, it, it is true that sometimes when you are defining a denotational semantics for a very complicated language, you do need to go off and invent new mathematics. Um, but there are cases where doing things denotationally is justified. Um, and one area that I've always found it very useful, and, and if you look back at, at a lot of my work, I almost am always using denotational models. And that's when you're doing language design, I think it's important um, not just to give a precise formal description of the semantics of your language, but to actually have some mathematical model that your programs describe. And making sure that that mathematical model has enough structure to interpret the operators that are in your language in a compositional way. So for me, at least, when I do language design, I usually start out by not thinking too much about math. I just try to sort of do something that is elegant. And then when I have something I think is pretty nice, I try to sit down and formalize it. And I try to figure out you know, what is the set of mathematical structures that I need to implement to understand the meaning of programs in this language. Um, if you're in a domain that is uh, sufficiently simple, and NetCat certainly satisfies this. It's you know, not higher order. Um, it doesn't have complicated concurrency and so on then all of the potential downsides of denotational semantics just don't apply. You don't have to worry about doing topology or you know, Scott infinity constructions or things. It's just like you don't have to do that. Um, you can just work with simple models like, uh, like computable functions. Um, so that was a little bit of a sermon, but I, you know, I think um, um, there's this whole style of semantics that has gotten a little bit lost uh, uh, because of the uh, attraction and, and, and dominance of operational techniques. Um, and I would encourage you not to, uh, not to ignore denotational, denotational techniques in your work in the future. OK, so end of my sermon. Um, so for NetCat, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, interpret these programs as functions. And I'm going to show you the semantics in kind of two steps. Um, so if we don't consider the link operator, then every program describes a function that just runs on one device. And I'll call this netcat without the operator. It's sort of the local fragment of the language. Um, so there, we can think of a program as describing a function that runs on one device. And so I can just model it as a function that takes in a packet and then produces zero or more packets. So say a set of packets. And it's zero or more because the packet might be dropped, in which case I get the empty set of packets. The common case is the packet gets sort of moved to some other port. So that's where I get a singleton set. But I could also have things like the flood, uh, you know, implementations of flood-like functionality would produce multiple packets at different ports that then get forwarded out. So that's why I have a set. OK, so that's the local fragment. And we'll see how to interpret all of these uh, in, in, um, as functions from packets to sets of packets. <laughs> if I consider the full language, as I said, you know, NetCat offers these network-wide abstractions. And so, now, you know, reasoning just about individual packets isn't really enough. And I want to be able to distinguish between programs that forward on one path versus another path, but have the same overall input-output behavior. So here in this little triangle topology, you know, I might care if packets take the upper path or if they take the lower path. But if the network uh, doesn't modify any of the header bits, it just moves things from the left to the right, if my denotational model was just functions from packets to sets of packets, these two programs would be equivalent. Right? They're the same function on packets. And so to avoid that, I'm going to actually um, model 
full Netcat programs as functions on packet histories. And a packet history is just a non-empty list of packets. So essentially what's going to happen is we're going to remember all of the intermediate packets that we saw as we went through the network in the semantics. And now a program that forwards on the upper path will have a different history than one that took the lower path. And so these programs will not be distinguished. Um, one aside, um, if you don't care about paths, you can, um, uh, you, you could interpret global programs in the simpler packet to packet set model and then you know, programs that take, the same, that take different paths but have the same overall input output behavior would be equivalent. Um, so that's a, and you can even get that semantic sort of syntactically. So we'll see that a little bit later today. Okay, so let me try and show you uh, with pictures sort of how we interpret each of the operators. Um, so what, these pictures are a little bit imprecise. I'll give you formal definitions in about 10 slides. Um, but what these pictures do is basically, on the left, I'll depict the input packet history. And I'll just draw that as a sort of vector with the head packet and then other packets as dot dot. And then on the right, uh, you'll see, uh, I don't have a good way of drawing all the sets, but sort of the sets of packets that you get. So um, for false, false is a, uh, predicate that, uh, when interpreted in NetCat, gives us the function that filters away everything. So we take in any packet and we just drop it and produce nothing as output. True is just the identity function. Or more precisely, it takes in any input packet and produces a singleton set on the right. And then uh, tests uh, behave sort of like the uh, combination of false and true. So we take in an input packet and on the top, if the F field of the packet satisfies the test, then we produce it as a singleton output. And if it doesn't, we produce nothing. Modifications uh, always produce a singleton. So they take in any packet and they modify the F field so that it's set to N. So we get a singleton output where the head packet in the history has been updated so that its F field is N. And I'll use the standard kind of assignment notation for that. Okay, so things get more interesting with, uh, with the various operators of the Boolean algebra and, and cleaning algebra. Um, so for the union operator, which is also disjunction, and I'll leave it as an exercise to convince yourself that uh, when used with predicates, this thing uh, behaves like a disjunction. What happens is the packet comes in, and the diagram doesn't quite explain this, but basically the packet gets copied. And one copy gets sent to Paul 1, and another copy gets sent to Paul 2. Now both of these produce um, both of these produce sets. And what we do to combine them into a single set is we just take the union of those sets. So if uh, only one side produces any output, then that set will appear here and nothing gets contributed from this side. If uh, they both produce the same packet, then we'll only produce one copy of that packet in the final set because it's a set semantics. Um, and, and that's what it does. Um, the way to convince yourself that this thing behaves like disjunction is um, for a, uh, there's a lemma you could prove, which is for the Boolean algebra fragment of netcat, so false, true, tests, plus dot and negation, the semantics is always a function that produces either the empty set or a singleton containing the input. And so, you can then convince yourself that this union operator behaves like disjunction. Right? The upper program either produces the empty set or the singleton containing the input, and the same for the bottom one. And so you know, if, if they both match the packet, then you get the singleton from both, and that gets combined into just a singleton. If neither of them matches, you get two empty sets combined to empty set. And if, if only one of them does, you get the output. So the overall predicate is satisfied. Okay. Um, let's move on to uh, dot or sequential composition, which I've wonderfully written both ways on this slide. Um, so the, the idea in sequential composition is just that we basically wire uh, these two programs together. Um, so basically the input packet comes in, it gets fed into the first program. Um, and this diagram doesn't quite give us enough to see what's going on, but it, notice that there's a type mismatch. So here, uh, we're getting a set of values coming out, whereas this program uh, describes, uh, denotes a function that takes a single packet. And so what we do is, uh, if I was being a little more 
formal here, I would actually lift this operator so it works on a set of inputs. Um, and what's meant by this diagram is that basically each of the outputs here gets fed through this program one by one, and then I take the union of all those results. And so that's what I get here. Um, so note that this is not an operational model. Um, so I'm not saying which one happens first. Okay, I'm giving a... Yeah, so I guess my diagrams are giving operational connotations that are not intended. Okay, not yeah. I mean, you'll see when we get to the, <coughs> the actual formal definitions. Um, and let me jump back to my sermon about denotational semantics again. So one reason that... Uh, denotational semantics is so wonderful is that you don't have to commit to these kinds of decisions. Um, in an operational semantics, you have to decide, you know, is, is, are my implementations of Boolean operators going to be the standard short-circuiting ones or not? Are they, you know, lazy or eager? So you have to make all these choices. Um, in denotational semantics, you often don't have to do that. Um, and so um, to, to sort of parrot one of my uh, teachers, Glenn Winskill is one of the great... Uh, advocates for denotational models, you know, he, he would say, I, I think, that uh, you, know, you don't really understand what's going on in a language until you've been able to write down a denotational model for it, where you're not committing to potentially ad hoc operational decisions. I mean, your, your question to illustrate, in my diagram, you know, it does a bad job of misleading you and thinking that this thing is operationally, you know, must be implemented a certain way. Okay. Um, <laughs> Negation, uh, just uh, basically, it's, it's, it only, again, is restricted to work on predicates, so it drops the input packet if the policy produces any output and otherwise uh, just copies it to the output. Um, that's what this circuit is meant to denote. And then uh, star uh, takes a fixed point, so basically we feed in the packet that produces some set, we take each of the elements of that output set, and we include them in the output and also run them back through. Um, and we do this to reach a fixed point. And then link uh, behaves, again, like a kind of uh, combination of a predicate, because it, it's guarded to make sure that the packet that's coming in is on switch S. So that's why we have two cases here. But then it does something uh, interesting. So when the packet coming in is on switch S, we add something to the packet history. So we, we take the input packet and we save it away. And we take a fresh copy of the packet and we move it over to switch S. So this is what makes the history longer. It's what, mean, it's what lets us track the paths that packets take through the network. There's some duplication going on here, and that's important. And then, uh, just to give a sane definition, if the packet's not at switch S, then we just produce nothing. It behaves like a, a filter. Okay. So let's see this uh, a little more formally. Um, so again, we're going to define this compositional translation um, that takes us from a program to a description of a function uh, that... Yeah? Um, so when you assign to a port field, that also moves it in a lot of links. So why do you not need to copy the output and output? So when you move something to a port... Um, yeah, this is a good question. It's a bit subtle. Um, what should happen if you assign the port to one and then assign the port to do and sequentially compose them together? You could, you could assume that as soon as a packet kind of is assigned to port one, the link sort of grabs the packet and slurps it out. Um, we chose a different design, which I think is better, which is um, on a switch, you can do as many modifications as you want. So you can assign the port multiple times. That is actually useful. It sounds bizarre. Why would you want to do that? But it's actually useful if you're composing modules together. You can sort of, you can even have virtual ports that don't exist. So you can sort of move pack, you know, classify packets, move them to some pretend ports, and then further process them from there. And not until, when, when you go over a link, that's when the packet actually gets output. Um, so that's the reason why we don't duplicate from modifications to ports. So if the packet is eventually, so once the packet is eventually completely processed by a circuit, is it still, does he still have the copy of the packet, even if you haven't used the arrow operator? Um, in the semantics, no. So if you, if you only describe, if you write a program without switch, then there will, the semantics will always take, say, a, a history with one element and produce a set of histories with at most one element. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, this question's a good one. It, I, I don't have time to go into it in detail. When we develop automata models for Netcat, you'll see exactly what's happening. And um, it's actually one of the pieces of the design that's, well, most audiences that I give talks on Netcat to don't get, so I'm happy that you asked the question. And it's one of the things that kind of makes the language especially beautiful is how it combines local processing and global processing in this way that I think is elegant. Okay, so let me run through the formal definition of the semantics. So we're going to define this inductive uh, translation. It's compositional, and it gives us functions from histories to sets of histories. And just notationally, the way I'm going to describe these functions, I could use lambda notation or some other notation for describing functions. I'm just going to describe them kind of point-wise. So I'll write the input history to the left of the equal sign and then give the set that you get. So for predicates, it's pretty standard. Oops, and I left off the H there. So for, for true, we take in some input history, and we always produce a singleton set with just that history. And for false, there should be an H there. We produce empty. For tests, uh, remember that histories are always non-empty. So I'll use cons notation to sort of let me match on the top element. Um, if the packet, uh, if its F field matches N, then we produce a singleton. Otherwise, we produce the empty set. Um, for negation, uh, Again, because it's restricted to predicates, uh, basically it always produces the input packet or not. Um, you can describe it concisely just as take all packets and do set difference uh, the policy. Um, for uh, modifications, we just clobber the head packet. For union, we just supply the history to both Paul 1 and Paul 2. So you see the copying that's going on there. And then we take the union of the results they produce. Um, for sequential composition, um, again, we need this operator that sort of lifts Paul 2 um, and uh, takes all the outputs produced by Paul 1 and takes that set and runs it through Paul 2 and then takes the union. Um, this is a little bit subtle, and this comes up often in geontational semantics, but this operator here is meant to be a mathematical operator. Uh, uh, it's essentially, if you've heard of Claisley composition, that's what it is, uh, whereas this is the syntactic operator. So this definition looks kind of trivial, but uh, this is actually a separate operator that lifts one of these functions to work on sets, and it does so by apl applying it to each element of the input and then taking the union of the results. Okay, and then once we've combined these functions using Clasley composition, we can just pass the input to that. Uh, star is just a standard uh, fixed point, so we take uh, each of the iterates of the function denoted by the policy, um, where uh, sort of a a function raised to the zero power, uh, in this case, we'll just take it to be the identity, and then to the one power is just the function itself. Squared is the composition of the function with itself, uh, again, using classy composition. And so we just take the union of uh, all compositions of the function with itself zero more times, and then uh, apply h to that. Um, and then link, again, has this behavior of duplicating packets uh, and, but only if the packet's actually at us. So the domain of the function the domain and the codomain of the function are not the same. Yeah, so that's why, um, again, there's a lifting going on here. So that's the, the, let me, when I post these notes online, let me add some additional comments here to explain more precisely what's going on. But essentially, in the same way as we can't compose two functions because the, as you said, the domain and codomain are not the same. We can lift a function so that it goes from history sets to history sets. And that's the same thing that's going on here. But uh, let me, when I post these slides, I'll add a couple of, of the supporting definitions that I haven't given here. Okay. Um, let me show you some examples of what it's like to work in the language. And then I think I'll be almost out of time. Um, so, for the sake of this example, I'm going to implement a little program on this toy topology with, with one switch and four hosts, where I want to forward all packets to host one and four, but monitor traffic that's going to any other host. If somehow some other host gets on my network, I want to know that. I want to flood any broadcast traffic. So there's special Ethernet broadcast addresses. And I want to block SSH traffic uh, coming from host one and two. So what I want to do is basically build up this open flow table. It does all these things. Um, and the way I can do it in Netcat, again, using some of the syntactic sugar that we saw, is I can actually implement these components separately and then glue them together. So my forwarding policy that just forwards everything 
between hosts 1, 2, 3, and 4, is going to match on their destination addresses and then send out the associated port. I'm assuming I know that association already. And otherwise, it just behaves like drop, which sometimes read as false. Um, for broadcast traffic, um, we're going to add, uh, basically, we're going to um, <coughs> write this flood program uh, that uh, enumerates every possible input port and then forwards out all other ports. So notice that plus copies the packet. So if packets come in on port one, then we make three copies and we send one to port two, one to port three, and one to port four. And we do that for all other ports. So this is kind of the flood primitive. And then our broadcast policy says, if the ethernet address is uh, the all ones MAC address, uh, then we're going to flood and otherwise do nothing. Okay, so our overall routing behavior is basically the union of forwarding and broadcasting. Then, uh, because we said we wanted to monitor any traffic that's not coming from these hosts, uh, we can use a predicate that tests for all of these hosts. And if it's not that, then uh, we'll set the port to a string unknown. And I haven't said this, but NetCat has uh, this nice feature that you can use ports uh, that are physical ports, and you can also um, use ports that are just named by strings. And the semantics of a port named by a string is that causes those packets to get sent to the controller on a name channel. So you can basically then listen on the controller for uh, things on the unknown channel, and you'll get all those packets. Okay, and then the firewall just blocks SSH traffic coming from host one and two. Okay, and then the overall program is just our routing program composed with our monitoring program composed with our firewall, and it compiles to this. Okay, so that shows you, you know, how uh, Netcat's uh, modular composition operators uh, make it easier to uh, build these, you know, somewhat complicated tables um, in a compositional way. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of um, some of the further applications of Netcat-like languages. Um, so we'll spend the afternoon doing all kinds of meta theory. Um, but Netcat's also been used uh, for um, some more practical things. Um, and I'll just step through some of these examples. So you can use Netcat to build uh, an abstraction that lets you build isolated slices of the networks, uh, network virtualization, as we saw. Um, and we've also used it for some debugging, fault tolerance, some performance aspects, and other things. Um, so just to motivate isolation, um, imagine that you are Amazon or Microsoft Azure or Google, Google Cloud Compute, um, and you have multiple tenants that have rented machines and network from you. Um, and so you know, we want uh, to give each tenant, maybe the green tenant and the blue tenant, the illusion that they have their own private network and there's no interference from any other tenants. In practice, though, we're going to run all of their uh, traffic through the same devices. So some devices may sort of only process blue traffic, some may only process green traffic, but some will process both. So um, the way you can uh, implement these kinds of slices in Netcat is, is a bit of syntactic sugar. Um, so we're going to extend the language with um, uh, these kind of triples uh, where we have an ingress predicate that specifies which traffic that's sort of in the world, not in any slice, should come into this slice. Um, we have a string identifier that serves as the sort of unique identifier for this slice. And then we have a possibly global netcat policy uh, that uh, governs the forwarding behavior within that slice. And then we also have an egress predicate that says uh, what, when packets should leave the slice and sort of go back into the world. And uh, we can actually desugar this into uh, this sort of more complicated uh, expression you see here. Um, so basically, um, we have a preamble that says any traffic that's not currently tagged that matches the ingress, tag it as coming from X, uh, or also any traffic that's already tagged with X. So pre basically uh, matches already tagged packets and or packets that should be tagged as being in X. And similarly, the post uh, matches packets that are tagged in the output or uh, things that are not in the output. 
And then our policy is just the sequential composition of the policy specified by the programmer uh, wrapped with this pre and post. Okay, I don't have a slide for this. Um, and one thing you can prove is that uh, you actually get a kind of non-interference theorem. Um, so you can prove that the behavior of uh, any number of slices, uh, let's just say there are two, if you have two slices that are running side by side in the same network, so they've compiled to the same routing tables, their behavior is the same as if they'd been running on private networks uh, independently. And so as corollaries, uh, you, can, you know that uh, there's no traffic that's leaking from one slice to another uh, or vice versa. Okay, another example is uh, network virtualization. So we already saw this in my sort of warm-up programming example where sometimes it's convenient. Oh, question? Uh, why, why this? Yeah, so basically what's going to happen is um, because this program, so packets are sort of going hop by hop through the network, but we want to describe uh, several different kinds of behaviors. Coming into a slice, already being in a slice, and then going through the program some more, and exiting the slice. So maybe I can take this offline, but that's, that, that's the reason for that, that disjunction. Oh, yeah, uh, the plus, uh, right, the plus is combining this sequential composition and this. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I should add some friends for that. Okay, uh, quickly, so network virtualization is this uh, idea that we can run programs written against an abstract topology, um, even though uh, the actual physical topology is much more complicated. Um, and this has another, a number of nice high-level benefits, like, you know, you can limit what modules can see about the physical topology. Um, you can use the structure of the virtual network to enforce certain kinds of isolation properties. Um, and maybe most nice, you can actually get a form of code reuse. So, you know, if, if I write a firewall, um, if I have to write the firewall for the physical topology, I may have to, you know, talk about devices all throughout the network. If I can instead write a firewall for a virtual topology and separate the mapping between this and the physical topology, I can just once write a firewall and then run it on any topology and know that it gives me protection. So being able to sort of decouple the concrete identifiers in code uh, from our programs is useful. And this is just a sketch, um, but oh, so let, me, let me skip this example because I'm short on time. Um, this is just a sketch, and we'll see this on Monday. Um, but it turns out that because Netcat has sequential composition, um, we can actually implement a very simple form of virtualization uh, sort of as a syntactic transformation in the language. So the idea is that we want to logically process packets as if when they come in on the physical network at some ingress, if they're at a location that is associated with the virtual network, then they sort of get levitated up to the virtual network, and then we sort of run the function specified in the virtual network, then uh, the packet's going to come back down because uh, after one step of processing in the virtual network, it hasn't actually gone anywhere. And then in the physical network, we need to carry it over to whatever associated location was in the virtual network. And then maybe we're done after one step, then we would egress the network. And so essentially, um, there's many details that we'll see on Monday, but essentially this form of processing is uh, we come in on some ingress and then in some number of steps, we go up to the virtual network, we run the virtual application logic, we come back down, we go across the physical fabric to um, get back to the location where we should be, and then maybe do this again, and then eventually we egress the network. So uh, again, you can build a compiler that sort of takes virtual programs and munges them down into just plain NetCat programs that can then be compiled. Um, a couple other examples, uh, fault tolerance. Um, so one thing people often want is uh, networks that can uh, continue to work even if there's uh, various links that break. Um, and so uh, we built uh, a, a language called Fat Tire on top of Netcat that uh, lets you specify uh, paths and backup policies. Um, so essentially, you know, you can specify either use the red path first, and if that fails, then use the blue path. And using some features called Fast Failover and OpenFlow 1.3, we were able to compile these down to programs that in the network would basically detect if 
the red path fails and then fall over to the blue path automatically without the controller being in the loop. Um, so the same kind of path abstractions that the Kalini algebra provides are useful there. And then very quickly, um, another example of a more complicated thing you could want to do in, in a network where, again, netcat-like constructs are useful is quality of service. Um, so uh, you know, typically, if someone's programming the network, they don't just care about which paths the network takes, but also how much traffic is going over certain paths. Um, so as a very simple example, you can imagine, you know, in a, maybe a corporate network, wanting to give priority to uh, VoIP traffic over web traffic, because, uh, you know, telephone calls uh, need more performance. Uh, maybe you want to do deep packet inspection on web traffic, and so you have some box that can do deep packet inspection um, and just sort of logs things for offline analysis. Um, you want to reserve some bandwidth for Hadoop, and you want to block traffic from evil.com. Um, so we built a system called Merlin, which again is based on a netcat-like language, um, but it adds the ability to talk about how much traffic is going over uh, each link. And we use uh, Pressburger arithmetic constraints to express uh, upper and lower bounds on, uh, on, on, those, on, on those capacities, or on, those, on the amount of traffic. Um, and so uh, the way this works is actually we take netcat's abstractions, we compile them to automata, we then uh, add some of the additional constraints having to do with bandwidth and some of these middle boxes. And we actually use a constraint optimizer to pick the optimal allocation of placement of functionality and uh, provisioning of bandwidth to satisfy our overall policy. Okay, so that was just a very quick taste of, you know, Netcat's kind of this uh, simple static uh, language for describing packet forwarding, but it can be used as a building block for building lots of uh, richer forms of functionality as well. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, I think you know, programming languages, uh, again, have this important role to play in networking. Uh, the Netcat language, which is based on essentially Boolean predicates and uh, regular paths, gives a nice building block for building a large variety of uh, network applications. And I think I'm well over, so I'll, I'll just stop there. Um, and uh, I will post on Piazza some slightly revised notes. Uh, several people asked about that. I'll also post instructions about um, programming exercises if you'd like to try out our virtual machine and some of our tools. And I'll see you again at 3.30 for uh, really fun equational reasoning, automata, and verification. All right, thanks. Thank